Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the uh, webinar that we've got today. Uh, it's part of the Heathrow Lunch Club webinar um, program. I guess Heathrow Lunch Club, not everybody's aware of. Um, we've had a few people join from outside of the usual thing. Usually takes place at Beaumont Estate. Obviously, uh, as the times are what they are at the moment, um, we can't hold any face to face events. So, uh, hopefully, this uh, would be informative. Uh, Surin's kindly joined us today to um, help us out. And uh, he was obviously booked, um, well, about 12 months ago now. So, uh, way before even COVID was on anyone's agenda. Um, my name's Sam Goodsell. I'm one of the directors at the Heathrow office. Um, so, I am just doing the introduction and bits. Um, just so people are aware, the agenda is, um, I guess, a few housekeeping matters that I'll cover. Um, then we will go to Surin Firu, who's the Chief Economist at uh, the British Chamber of Commerce. He will do a presentation. Uh, that's going to be about 20 to 25 minutes or so. Um, and then we will cover off some questions. We've had a good number of questions that came in from the original bookings. Um, so we'll pick up on those. And obviously, um, as most people are aware of with Zoom, You've got the question and answer function down at the bottom, so please use that. Uh, you're also able to like the questions, um, which will obviously give us an indication as to which ones to pick up on first. Um, so do open the question and answer window, and as they're added, um, feel free to uh, like those. Overall, uh, we're expecting today to run for about 45 minutes to an hour. Um, it largely depends on the questions that uh, are raised today. Um, so um, that should uh, sort of uh, set the agenda in part. Um, hopefully everybody's happy with Zoom um, and how it works and the functionality. Um, obviously everybody's on mute um, at the moment, so uh, use the chat function. I can see a few people have already done that. Um, so before I hand over to Siren, I just want to cover off a couple of poll questions. Um, I think it's useful for us to understand who's in the room and what people's thoughts are at the moment. So hopefully we can put those on screen now. Uh, there's four questions in total, uh, two to start with. So are you currently remote working or working from an office premises at least partially? So that's question one. And question two, do you think we are going to see a second lockdown come into action during the pandemic? We just wait a minute for answers to come in. Okay, so that's quite interesting. Um, I guess, well, almost half are, are doing some form of, uh, of office work and almost half are working completely at home. Um, a few people, a small uh, number, so 13% are doing five days. And the second lockdown, I think, is overwhelmingly yes at the moment. So uh, I'm sure Surin's going to uh, give some thoughts on that um, a bit. So, uh, yeah, we look forward to, to your input. And the next poll. So how confident you are, you, are you in the UK government? Obviously, we've got uh, the COVID scenario and Brexit at the moment. So I guess we've got two major things and, and obviously everything else that the government do. And do you think we'll reach a deal on Brexit? So if people can just answer those, that would be really useful. Just a few more seconds on that. So again, um, fairly decisive uh, opinions there. I think not very confident in the government um, there and well, pretty evenly spread over the Brexit scenario. So uh, again, useful information um, for Sir and there. Um, so, no, that's really good. Um, so, without further ado, I'll hand over to Surin. Once Surin has spoken, um, my colleague Lucy will uh, join. She will run the um, questions um, towards the end and we'll go from there. Thank you very much. Thank, 
Thanks, Sam, and, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, so some really interesting uh, poll uh, response to that, particularly around the UK government. Um, so I'm going to first do, the, hopefully, the most difficult part of this is trying to share my screen to see if this works. So hopefully you can, you can all see that okay. Um, so yeah, so my name is Srenth Thiru, Head of Economics at the British Chambers of Commerce. I'm here today to provide an economic update to give you a bit of a sense of the state of play in the UK economy. Uh, I've, I've, had, I've done a particular focus on what's happened since the economy has started to reopen. So basically looking at what's happened in the third quarter of this year, a few thoughts on what might happen in the next couple of months. Uh, particularly with Brexit, um, and then sort of finish off with a few off suggestions of what the government could do to hopefully mitigate some of these sort of challenges that may be coming further down the line in potentially the second lockdown, as mentioned in the poll. So just a brief introduction before I get into the meat of the data. So, uh, so it's an arm for the British Chambers of Commerce. For those who aren't aware, the British Chambers of Commerce are a network of 53 accredited Chambers of Commerce across the UK and in several markets all around the world. We're very much a bottom-up organisation, so if you're a business, you'll join a local chamber of commerce, depending on what part of the country you're in. Um, and then you, and what we do at the BCC is bring, bring people together at a national level um, to tackle the key issues, such as the COVID pandemic, such as Brexit. And we're very much a broad uh, business organisation that we cover all sectors and all business sizes, from, from a one-man band up to large corporates. But the main run for our membership is within sort of the SME space. And the data I'm going to focus, focus on today, um, because it's the latest data out there, is from our own survey work that we do. And now one of the things we do produce is a quarterly economic survey, which was published uh, just last Friday, so it's hot off the press. Um, and this data is the biggest private sector survey of business sentiment in the UK. Um, we regularly poll around six to 7,000 businesses each quarter. And I say that covers all types of businesses from all parts of the UK. And, and we use that in data to help support uh, lobbying of government or what should be the key priorities of businesses. And also to give them an up-to-date view of what's happening in the wider economy. Um, so just a sense of, what, of, of how that data breaks down, um, it essentially reflects what's going on in, in, in wider economy in terms of the overall structure. So it's large, there's a large services component to the data uh, compared to manufacturing, a large chunk of it is, is, is in SMEs. Um, and the fillwork period is quite significant because the fillwork period is the sort of last week of August um, to sort of mid-September. Um, so, so, so it was just before some of the most recent restrictions came in place. And also just before the uh, the Chancellor's e uh, winter economy plan as well. So that's those sort of things aren't necessarily factored into our data, but it's it is, it is as updated as you can get at the moment. So what is it showing? Well, it's showing unfortunately a really weak picture uh, across the economy. Um, so this chart shows um, UK um, GDP data, economic growth data. Um, versus some of the more timely data that we produce on services and manufacturing in terms of domestic sales. And what you can see as versus context, what, what happened in Q2. So if you look at, at the right hand side of the graph, you can see the huge 19.8% decline in UK economic in, in UK economy in the second quarter of this year um, as, the, as, the, as the lockdown sort of came into full effect and around I think around two thirds of the economy was shut down and you can see that had a huge impact a record fall in, in UK GDP in that quarter um, and what we're looking at at the moment is is I guess what's happened since then and that's what we see from our own data uh, from our survey and you can see for both services and manufacturing we have seen a slight improvement in the third quarter of this year but nowhere near uh, the levels uh, that were in sort of Q1 i.e uh, pre-crisis levels you can see it from the chart for both manufacturing and services now, what's important to note from this chart in terms of this survey data is that it, what we record is a balanced score. So we look at what's the amount of businesses saying that uh, they've seen an increase in sales versus those who said they've seen a decrease. And what you can see, there's still more firms seeing a decrease in activity than an increase in the third quarter of this year. Um, and that, while that, is, well, the, the, that ratio is, is improved since the second quarter, um, it's nowhere near what we were pre crisis levels and nowhere near sort of positive territory, which we back up to that zero level on the chart. Um, at a sector level, we are seeing some differences in data. So we are seeing those sectors where some of the restrictions, such as social distancing, are more easily managed, doing slightly better. Um, that would be, for example, the manufacturing. Or we're seeing um, elements of the service sector, particularly the consumer-focused uh, parts of the sector, such as retail and hospitality, 
still struggling to bounce back from uh, what we saw in Q2. And we think that's going to be a trend going forward. But, but I would say also, even with manufacturing, it's, it's not great. It's, it's probably less worse than the services, but it's still not great at all. And I think you are seeing within, within, um, within the manufacturing sector sort of huge differences between those parts of the sector that are doing really well, such as pharmaceuticals, to those parts of the economy where the demand has dropped off a cliff, such as, as in civil, civil aviation. So it's real split in within sectors, but overall the picture is really weak. But overall, I said manufacturing sector is doing slightly better than services, but it's still really weak by historic standards. Um, and last, just to give you a bit of context of where we are at the moment. Um, now, clearly, this is a huge record recession, but in terms of historical context, if you look to the left of the chart, you can see where the, the global financial crisis in is. And you can imagine back in 2008, 2009, how big a impact that had on the economy and the legacy impact of that. But just look at the, the, the scale of, of the, what the COVID impact now compared to where we're in the global financial crisis. It it's far exceeds where, it, where we're seeing now. And even the bounce back as the economy has reopened, it's still nowhere near back the levels we saw sort of, um, you know, pre, you know, pre-crisis also they're still pretty much in line with where we saw what we saw during the financial crisis so the economy has taken a huge hit over the last couple of months and you know and, and a huge hit and and how the uk economy recovers from that is going to be a, clearly a, a key uh, forward-looking uh, path for it for both jobs and and livelihoods moving on to moving on to the regional picture and as you see the picture is pretty bleak across the uk um, we can see, I mean, this, this graph goes in shades from green to red, um, and you can see it's pretty much all red, um, just different shades of red um, across, across the UK. And what is quite interesting is that some elements where, uh, for example, the northeast, where we saw local restrictions coming more early than maybe other parts of the UK, we can see some activity really, really quite negative in that particular part of the country. But again, the overall picture is really weak, just different degrees. And again, that's similar to what we're seeing in the national picture. Moving on to sort of the international uh, export sales for UK businesses, um, we are seeing again a slight, slightly strong recovery um, in manufacturing and services, but excess, export sales overall are slightly weaker than the improvements slightly weaker than what we've seen in domestic sales. Um, for manufacturers in particular, what we saw in Q2 was huge disruption to supply chains. Um, some of that is, is repairing itself a little bit. But the demand is really weak, and we're seeing it across the board, really. But particularly in, in, in some in in for goods that have complex supply chains, with things moving back and forth across borders, across multiple borders, having quite a bit of impact in there. What well, you also have factoring in export sales in particular is the impact is some of the uncertainty around Brexit as well, and what's going to happen in the end of the transition period. That's probably having an impact on our export sales figures as well. So again. A similar trend where we're seeing that bounce back from the historic lows in um, Q2, but still really weak by historic standards. And the major age was just seeing a deceleration on the declines rather than a genuine improvement in underlying conditions. Moving on to some of our forward looking indicators. So these are the types of indicators that we look to to get a sense of what may happen beyond Q3 into the final part of this year and into next year. So this is looking at so these first couple of, of slides are looking at. Um, orders, so domestic and export orders. And what we can see across the board, really, we are seeing that improvement, but we are still seeing more businesses reporting a decrease in orders versus an increase. Um, again, a similar trend to what we've seen with, with sales and that it's still the manufacturing sector is slightly better, but still very much in negative territory. And what does that suggest? Well, it suggests that while Q3 might be a better quarter as the economy reopens, once you move past sort of the temporary boost from those sort of factors, you may see the economy sort of weaken sort of Q4 into Q1 next year, um, because all the books are, are really quite weak in the moment. And, and I think that plays, and that is probably mostly COVID, but also as we are starting to see the impact of, of uncertainty of what, what may happen in the, at the end of the transition period, impacting some of this data, some of this data as well. Moving on to investment. So investment is probably one area that's not talked about that much, but it's an area that we're particularly concerned about um, because investment is really key to, to kick-starting recovery, look, dealing with some of these long-standing issues like, like productivity, uh, like the sort of levelling up agenda across the UK. And what we see, investment has really been really taking a real hit, probably one of the biggest hits compared to some of other um, from up in terms of our other indicators. And what we're expecting is this to come back a lot more slowly than 
than some other parts of the economy. And again, we are seeing sort of services uh, do slightly worse than manufacturing. And again, that reflects some of the constraints or some of the uncertainties as well, because we are seeing those, sort of, again, those sort of consumer facing firms um, probably more, more exposed to further restrictions, further changes to some of the restrictions, some of the lockdown uh, measures. Um, so that you, you quite rightly would see they're probably more pessimistic about what might happen over the next few months. But again, it's still really weak all around. And this is particularly concerning. We're looking at what can maybe stimulate a recovery. Um, and again, similar theme. And when we talk about cash flow, and then as many of you aware, this is probably one of the key indicators that we track in our survey, because cash flow is the lifeblood of any business. And what we saw during the crisis, during the, during the first lockdown, is that um, cash was really the big issue for businesses. And what we saw is for when businesses saw their cats or their livelihoods or the businesses shut, shut overnight, and cash was a big problem. We saw you know cash rate drop off a cliff for many businesses, and that's very much the lifeblood of the business, of course. And that's why a lot of the lending, a lot of the government support schemes, such as lending, the lending schemes and the grant schemes, we very much focus on trying to get cash into businesses. And um, so what we've seen since the economy sort of generally opened in Q3, we have seen a bounce back and pretty relatively strong bounce back too for, for manufacturing, but still really weak by historic standards. You can see it's still not back to where we were sort of pre-COVID levels. And, and a breakdown of data shows that around one in three businesses are saying they have less than, less than three months worth of cash in reserve. So that's clearly a concern because if you think where we are now with the economy largely open, um, and most of the government support measures like the furlough scheme still in place. It's concerning that still quite a high portion of businesses are still reporting um, really low levels of cash in reserve. And that number sort of changes in, in terms of business type. So uh, smaller businesses have, have less, ca less cash reserve. Um, we're all seeing it at sector level as well. So again, those sort of C to B business, those, those B to C businesses, businesses like retail hospitality, put with less cash in reserve than other, other types of businesses. But this is, is concerning going forward because um, if we do get further restrictions or the reason we saw the end of the transition period, having less cash in reserve means that they're more exposed to these types of shocks. Um, and that's our concern particularly is that a lot of businesses, if we talk about moving to the second lockdown, a lot of businesses are much weaker positioned now to weather that storm than they were after the first lockdown happened in, in sort of March time so that's clear concern going forward and that should be something that the government should be looking at quite closely and um, now i do realize a lot of these slides so far have been painting a fairly bleak picture um but i would say there are some positive aspects it's like there are some ray, ray, rays of hope at the moment in the economy um one one massive one is the uk consumer so what we've seen uh, since the um since the uh, lockdown strict restrictions sort of eased um, sort of particularly in July and also in August as well, is that retail sales and, and consumer spending has, has bounced back quite strongly. Um, so retail sales, which is around a third of it was around, was around a third of consumer spending, um, is already four percent higher than pre-pandemic levels, and that's in contrast to large parts of the wider economy, um, and, and that's clearly a good sign because consumer spending is quite an important driver of UK economic growth. The UK consumer spending overall is around two thirds of UK economic output so it's clearly an important driver of, of, of overall activity and um, what's been driving that well there's a number of factors one of the factors has been that um, um, in the chancellor's summer um, summer economic statements um, in July um, we now announced sort of easements in stamp duty um, when, and when people buy houses they tend to buy other stuff to go in those houses and um, so we've seen this quite a strong bounce back in the housing market and that's helped to boost um, retail activity as well um, and the second factor is, and this is probably quite a significant factor, and also gives a sense of what what not might happen going forward, is what happened to is what happened to savings um, during the lockdown. And this graph shows um, household savings ratio, the household savings ratio um, for, UK, for households across the UK. This is basically how much of of what you earn from your salary, from from benefits, from dividends, etc., and other income. Um, how much, what portion of that are you saving? Now we can see, you know, this graph goes back to sort of the mid 1960s. And you can see there, we're not, we haven't been great savers historically in the UK. Um, it's a whole between sort of five and, and it went up a little bit um, sort of during the mid 90s and, and after, just after the financial crisis, it's around just over 10%. Um, but that's probably, again, so all that's probably relatively weak by historic standards. 
If I look right to the right hand side of the graph, you can see what happened in the second quarter of this year as the UK economy went to lockdown. A huge surge in the amount of, of money uh, households were saving. It went up to 29%. Um, so this means that for every £100 a household was earning, um, £29 of that was being saved, which is huge, which is a huge amount. And you look at it from the graph perspective as well, it's huge from historic standards. Um, so what we like to have seen in Q3 is, is unwinding of some of that, that built up savings um, that people have done. Because what were you, if you remember during sort of Q2, um, and he went around shops and, and he saw much, le much less things available. There's much less opportunities to spend money in restaurants and you know, going to cinemas and uh, music events, etc. So a lot of people just save their money. So there are, there are a lot of households sitting on money at the moment, although a lot, of course a lot of other households struggling as well. So what you've seen since restrictions of ease is, is an easing down on some of those savings. As people have spent money they couldn't spend uh, previous uh, in the second quarter as, as the economy was locked down. So we've seen some of the car, um, the car market. Many of you, you would have seen the, the pictures of sort of air, airports, um, um, air, airfields, um, you know, full of, of motor vehicles that have been unsold in the second quarter. A lot of them disappeared now. And, and that's, again, sort of the impact of the unwinding sort of pent up demand during the, uh, during the, pan, during the pandemic. I well, we would say um, on the retail side of things, well, it, it is a mixed picture when you look below, below the headline number. So overall it's 4% up. What we are seeing is, is those who are predominantly online retailers doing much better than those who are, who are more invested in bricks and mortar. Um, so you are seeing a mixed picture below sort of the headline retail figures as well. But overall, um, we are seeing a, 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 a relatively good resurgence in retail activity. Will that be sustained? Well, there's a couple of questions to decide whether that will be sustained. Firstly, is, is how much of that sort of savings that we've been built up in Q2 will run down? I think some of that has happened in Q3, but will that happen going forward? And one of the key um, sort of, uh, drivers of whether that will happen, and, whether, and also for the wider economy, is what was going to happen in the labour market. Now, labour market, labor market data, by its very nature, is pretty uh, backward looking. So the unemployment rate at the moment is around 4.1%, which is very, which has barely changed since um, before the pandemic. Um, and that's due to a number of reasons. Um, I mean, most headline indicators of labor market tend to be backward looking, just the way they're measured. But also, and more significantly for this crisis, is the impact of the furlough scheme. The furlough scheme has actually put the labor market into, into uh, in a suspended, suspended, uh, suspended even, suspended animation over that period. Um, and what we've seen is that that's actually an impact on the headline data, which means you've not really seen the true picture. Uh, but we are starting to see that uh, emerging. So what we've seen the, in some of the other sort of less core indicators, such as number of people and employees and payroll, that's fallen by around 700,000 since the start of the since the start of the pandemic, sort of early March time. What we're all seeing is the possible nature of the jobs crisis that we may well see as the furlough scheme ends. And particularly if you look at this chart, this chart shows uh, what's happened to employment um, by age group. And what you can see, actually for most age groups, um, the um, employment is still rising. Um, but what you see in marked contrast is those people aged 16 to 24. They're, that's already on the sharp downward, uh, downward path. Um, and that's unfortunately what we see in previous recessions is that it's actually young people who get hit hardest, uh, particularly if it's a jobs um, heavy type recession, which we're likely to see in the moment. Um, because what you tend to see, again, linking to those charts I mentioned earlier, those sectors that are most uh, impacted by the pandemic, those in industries that are consumer facing, for example, tend to have a high proportion of young people working in those particular types of jobs and types of sectors. So unfortunately, what we are seeing, what we are likely to see is, is, a, is a huge surge in unemployment, but an even bigger surge in youth unemployment over that period. So that's clearly a concern, and that's why what we're seeing from the government is a lot of, lot of focus is on young people trying to make sure that there are training opportunities there for them. There are other opportunities there for them as well. And, and just in terms of looking at what might happen over the next couple of months, one sort of, again, one sort of buffer to the, sort of the jobs impact has been the furlough scheme. Now, as many of you will be aware, the furlough scheme is due to end in, at the end of this month. Um, now, there's still a lot of people in that scheme, uh, you know, several million in that, in that scheme at the moment. Um, and, and, and the quick key question is what happens to them next? 
Um, now, the government have, have, an, have announced a further less generous scheme um, a couple of weeks ago called the Job Support Scheme. And we're, well, we think it may help some businesses. We're skeptical about how effective it's going to be to ward off a jobs crisis. Um, and indeed, in the survey, what we've also asked businesses is what they tend to do with their workforce over the next few months. And this shows it, and this shows it quite clearly, really. What you can see from this chart is that um, on, the, on the far right hand side is, for, is data for Q3. You see around 90%, you know, one in five businesses effectively saying that they will likely decrease their workforce over the next sort of three months, which is clearly concerning when you aggregate it up across the whole uh, uh, labor force. And I said the unemployment rate at the moment is around 4.1%. I mean, quite frankly, by the end of the year, you see it uh, double, at least double that rate uh, by the end of this year with a heavy skew again, as I mentioned, towards sort of young people within that. Um, so that's the overall picture for, for the economy, and I, and I realise that is pretty bleak. I, I would just round up, round off sort of the overall picture in terms of what our data shows. It is showing a still a really bleak picture for the UK economy. However, given the sort of the boost we like to get from retail, from consumer spending, um, particularly from the retail sector, um, supported in part by against government policies like the ETEC the Help Out scheme and and the VAT cut. You are like, and also I said, also the impact from re simply reopening the economy. You are likely to see the UK economy exit recession in Q3. Um, but the key question is going to be for most economists, most policymakers, is what happens next. And our survey tends to show that actually the picture is still really weak underneath. So if you remove sort of the government support schemes, if you remove that sort of temporary boost from reopening the economy, Q4 um, is likely to show a pretty weak picture once again. And particularly if you get more uh, local restrictions or if you get that sort of uh, oh, you know, sort of a national sort of lockdown um, similar to what we saw in March, April this year. So that's clearly a concern going forward. Um, but of course, another um, uh, um, sort of headwind for the UK economy potentially is the impact of Brexit. Um, now, of course, we have officially left the, the European Union at the start of this year, but um, we're currently in, in a transition period where nothing's really changed. Um, and as like I said, we're you know, you know, less than 100 days till the UK exits, uh, exits that transition period and, and, and moves on to sort of an independent footing uh, post, that, post that period. Um, so one of the things we've been looking at um, and here at BDC is how prepared businesses are for what may be coming, whether it's deal or no deal. And because that, that sort of translates directly in terms of the potential short term impacts of, of, the, of the end of the re transition period on the wider economy. And, and what we found is actually quite a concerning picture. And this chart shows, we've asked the question over the last couple of years, um, whether businesses, uh, what businesses are doing to prepare for Brexit. And the question we've asked over the last few years is whether they've carried out risk assessments. Um, this year we've asked it around the, the end of the transition period. And the previous years we've asked about you know, Brexit more generally, whether they've done a risk assessment about that. And as you can see, it's quite a certain picture. So just 38% of businesses have said that they've done a risk assessment this year around the impact of the transition period on of the end of the transition period on their business. Um, and this compares to 57% last year. And if you look at the chart for 2018 or the date of 2018, you see it's back, pretty much back to where we were uh, then. So that's quite a concerning picture. And if, if you bring on that data a little bit more, um, the, the split is, um, I guess, as you'd expect in some ways, and that. You have those smaller businesses um, who are doing less than large businesses. Um, you also see uh, those who are internationally active do more, so those who export or import directly um, do more to prepare than, than those who, are, who see themselves as UK only focused. And, and I would say those UK only focused businesses are a bit of a concern to us at the moment, because a lot of those businesses may not be aware that they may be part of quite quite longer supply chains, which, which may have a big manufacturer, for example, who has huge exposure to the EU and in the supply chain. So, so the actual transition period may have bigger impact on them, on them than they may foresee at the moment. I think some of that is again coming through in our data as well. Um, but we shouldn't also discount the COVID impacts on the transition as well uh, and businesses preparing for it because as you can quite rightly imagine is that, um, you know, firstly the bandwidth for businesses has been severely strained by them simply trying to survive the impact of COVID in the first lockdown and some restrictions we've seen now. But also there's been a cost implication as well. So if you remember my, my earlier chart around um, the impact on cash flow from the pandemic, a huge impact on businesses right across the board. 
So this has an impact on businesses being able to prepare for Brexit and prepare for an energy transition period. Because the money that, and resources and the stockpiles they may have built up to prepare for potentially a messy or the solely exit uh, from the transition period has essentially gone for a lot of businesses, particularly at the smaller end. Um, so actually that's made it much more difficult and much, have much more, much more room to actually prepare for Brexit and prepare for the transition period as well. Um, and another area that also businesses flagged to us as well is there are many ways they say preparing for the end of the transition period is a bit like moving, a bit like trying to hit a moving target. And the reason for this is it is based on another bit of research we've done. So one of the things we've, we've asked businesses and our sort of um, talking to businesses across the UK is what do they need to know to help them prepare for the for the end of the transition period, whether there's a deal or no deal. So this this will cover huge range of areas from customs arrangements to what tariffs they wanted to pay um, to if they want to hire some from the EU um, to some of the EU funding that that's currently provided. We came up with a list of around 35 questions uh, based on the, on these wide range of topics and that this is very, as a snapshot on the, on the slide here but the full sort of, uh, deck is available on our on our website and this shows around 20 just just around 26 out of 35 questions don't have an answer to. Um, and you can imagine that you know, we, as I said, less than, not, less than sort of 100 days from the uh, uh, end of the transition period. I saw the vast majority of questions that businesses need answering in a deal or no deal scenario still haven't been answered yet. And that's many ways while, why my point was that businesses still view this as trying to hit a moving target. And while a number of them are probably um, sort of zoned out a little bit because they're simply not getting the answers that they need to help them their prepare. Because businesses, you know, inherently, as I found in my experience working here at the BC, are very resilient and they, they, they're able to adapt where, as much as possible to new circumstances. We've seen that during the pandemic, businesses have been able to adapt their business in certain respects to, to some of the restrictions of social distancing. So we've seen restaurants or pubs moving to takeaways, for example. Um, but, and, and that's probably true for the end, the end of the transition period. But the fact remains that a lot of businesses just don't have the, the answers to those key practical questions. And that's holding up a lot of, of preparation. And if we don't get those answers, um, deal or no deal, that could be a hit to the economy as you move into move out to the transition period in, in, a, in a couple of months. So just to end on a relatively positive note, what can be done to try and mitigate some of the impacts, some of the economic impact of COVID? Um, now, of course, we have seen a lot of work that the government have done, so unprecedented really, um, in trying to mitigate the impact of COVID on the UK economy. We've seen the furlough scheme, we've seen some lending schemes, and um, we've seen other initiatives as well. All of them played a key role, and I think the furlough scheme has played a key role in at least limiting the impact of COVID on the on, on wider economy. But of course, what we've seen since then is that whereas in the sort of initial phase of the pandemic, we saw, saw sort of government economic policy sort of closely aligned to what was the economic impact on the ground um, was because it was very much a blanket approach for blanket response to the pandemic. So we've had, had four lockdowns and the appropriate response to that was um, a full furlough scheme for all businesses uh, to, to apply to and support was wide ranging. Um, but what we've seen now is the picture has become much more complicated in that we've moved more and towards localised uh, action and sectoral action. And unfortunately, government economic policy hasn't really kept pace. There's really a gap between what the government are, are doing and actually what's happening on the ground. And that's what we see uh, some of the impact and some of the figures we're seeing in the data that I mentioned earlier. Um, so we think there's a number of steps the government can take to help mitigate some of these impacts and close the gap between government economic policy and what's going on the ground. And that's going to be particularly important in the next couple of weeks and months as we potentially get more sort of localised lockdowns or even a second lockdown as well. So the first thing we think the government can do is actually probably not a fiscal response, it's actually to fix, fix uh, test and trace. The overwhelming feedback we get from, mem from members across the UK is that, you know, short of a vaccine, text and te uh, fixing uh, track and trace could be sort of a, not quite a silver bullet, but a real shock in the arm for both consumer and business confidence. So it will mean that uh, more of the economy can, to, can remain open for longer. It may mean that, may mean that less uh, restrictions are in place. 
um, and that will help support the economy while also keeping people safe as well. So fixing text, uh, test and trace is really important. And unfortunately, at the moment, a lot of businesses, as, as I'm sure uh, one of consumers, uh, don't really have confidence in it. So it's a lot of work to be done there. But I think, you know, short of getting a vaccine, fixing test and trace has been really important um, to, um, to mitigate some of the economic impact of COVID-19. Um, and as we move into a picture where we are likely to see further job losses, um, particularly as the furlough scheme ends and probably the job support scheme is probably only temporary and it's sort of benefit um, to the wider economy. What we do really need to see is more significant action to support businesses to retain and recruit staff. And this could cover a wide range of areas. Um, one of the things we think that they should look at is to support those type, those parts of the economy that are growing, that are supporting the recovery, to recruit uh, and also retain people as well. So one of the things we think they should do is cut the jobs tax, which is uh, essentially employs national insurance contributions, where, you, where for most jobs you pay around 13.8% sort of on top of someone's wages. If you cut that, I think that will help businesses retain and recruit staff. And again, that's going to be important, particularly as you move through a period where people are moving from one sector to another and, 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 and you know, some sectors become slightly smaller and some jobs go what you want to be in a position to do is make sure that make it easy as possible to help businesses recruit people and also retain people as well. Um, as I said, as we move on to sort of localised um, or, or um, sort of sectoral, more targeted approach, um, what we need is, again, some government policy to be more closely aligned to that. So we think what needs to happen is the government needs to introduce a more comprehensive lockdown support package. And um, essentially, uh, you plug into areas which are subject to local lockdown. So, for example, if a part of the country uh, was subject to new restrictions or a local lockdown, they would immediately get this, a suite of support, including grant funding similar to what we saw um, during the pandemic, where, we, where there were sort of grant funding around 10 or 25,000 available to businesses, depending on what type of businesses, what business it was. And we think something similar should be in place, again, to sort of try and mitigate the impact and actually compensate businesses for, um, what, for, for being told that they could have to shut down or, or, have, or be in restrictive practices. Um, through whatever period they need to uh, they need to be in place. Um, another area again, so I guess the top three we mentioned there is very much around um, sort of sort of I guess emergency measures trying to sort of block or limit the impact of COVID on the economy. But of course, there are parts of the economy that are growing, that are doing well, and what we need to do is make sure that these are adequate support to maybe pick up the slack really from other parts of the economy, particularly in terms of jobs, but also in terms of overall economic output. So one of the things we think should happen is that government should be looking at sort of stimulating business investment over this period. And one thing they can do is, is extending the annual investment allowance, um, which currently is set at 1 million. And that is due to end of the, at the end, of, end of this year. We know that could be extended for another two years. And also it could be extended to include some other elements, um, for example, in training, um, maybe even shape, try to shape behavior as you move into the longer term. For example, you know, shape, you know, if you invest in things around tra in transition to net zero, that be included in such an allowance again that's looking to maybe the government slogan so is to build back better that can be one element of that trying to shape behavior by by finding incentive investment centers to do so um and one of the other things i'm seeing businesses already is, is trying to stimulate activity across the uk and one of the biggest ways of doing that i'm seeing a bit in the housing market as well is to speed up infrastructure delivery so that's both digital and physical as well that's going to be really important. So by doing that, as well as having economic, long-term economic benefit of having that sort of improved, uh, increased infrastructure and particularly digital, uh, given the changes in the way that people work, I mean, you're also sort of stimulating supply chains and businesses that work within that. So you, you're stimulating wider activity. You've seen that a little bit in the housing market, where the housing market, uh, the, the stamp duty um, um, easements for this housing market has actually helped stimulate wider activity in the retail sector. So things, something similar in terms of you know, speeding up some of those infrastructure projects can really help sort of stimulate local economic activity, which is going to be really important going forward. So in many ways, what we're sort of, um, sort of flagging here is sort of a two-track approach. And of course, um, what's going to be really important is that UK and EU get a trade deal. Because as I said, you know, not having this all the exit from the transition period is going to add just further cost businesses for, and, and, the, and they'll be forced to use finances which they simply don't have at the moment. To be a further shock to the sorry, a further shock to the UK economy. So in summary, and again, this is an exhaustive list, and be good to hear maybe people on the call in terms of what you think. 
but our view certainly is that there should be a two track approach. So the emergency support to try and protect as many jobs and livelihoods as possible, but also a, a, a second track to look at what can be done to help support the recovery, support businesses who are recovering. Because it is, it is a more mixed picture out there. Um, and, it, and it's really important that we do support those businesses that are in a better position to, to grow their business, to start up. And there are a lot of startups doing recession as well. So we're, so we're looking at ways of helping them. So again, send that two track approach to make sure that we're not, so we are supporting as many people as possible, but we're not sort of starting the, any recovery, particularly in the next year. So in summary, um, the good news is that UK is set to exit recession in Q3, but as you see from our survey data, underlying conditions remain really weak across the board, really. Um, and we are expecting Q4 to be much more weaker, particularly with the ongoing restrictions. Um, we are, as I said, a lot of stuff remains um, below pre-crisis pre levels, but the big question for a lot of economists are, are we going to see a, a V-shaped star recovery? Our view is, our view is that's probably wishful thinking at this stage. Um, and the main reason for that is actually looking at the nature of the crisis, because I guess people who say, they think we're getting a feature recovery, expect the sort of short-term hit from a lockdown to have a short-term impact on, on the wider economy. But actually what we're seeing is, is what economists call economic scarring. So that short-term hits actually having long-term, is, is actually had a long-term impact, it's going to have long-term impact on the wider economy. And we're seeing that particularly in the jobs market. The picture is, is slightly mixed at a sector level. We are seeing in manufacturing sector, the sector things like better than some consumer focused firms, particularly those in um, retail hospitality. Uh, but this picture is still pretty weak across the board across most sectors of the economy. Um, one of the key sort of indicators that we track is cash flow. Again, the picture is fairly weak there. Um, and again, you know, key concern for us is that because cash flow is so weak at the moment for most businesses, you know, further hit from further restrictions to get second lockdown, or even though this all the exit work from the uh, transition period will have an impact uh, on these businesses much more harder than what we saw in the first part of this year in the first lockdown. Um, but the positive, relatively positive last questions I would like to leave you with is that there is stuff that can be done to help limit the impacts of COVID on the economy, uh, but it means that the government have to take steps to make sure that economic policy much more closely aligns to what was going on the ground, so the underground impact of the pandemic, which is much harder at the moment given the picture is very really much a fast moving picture. Uh, but we think these steps, the steps I mentioned in the previous slide could be could help at least limits on the impact on the wider economy. With that, thank you for, for, for listening. Um, I'm looking forward to these questions and discussion. Um, and with that, I'll hand back to Lucy. Hello. Yeah, you're good. Oh, hello. Thank you very much, Sue. And that was a very, very informative um, and lots and lots of information to digest. Um, and just to let everybody know, the uh, this is being recorded, and the recording and the slides will be available on our website afterwards, and we're able to um, send them to the attendees as well. So, so don't worry. There's a lot of information, but it'll still be there. Um, so thank you very much again. I'm going to run on to some questions that have been put forward. Um, and as a tax partner, I'm going to start with a tax-based question. You've mentioned um, during the presentation about um, some sort of incentives, you know, reductions in national insurance, the extension of the annual exemption allowance. Um, but obviously the Chancellor has got to pay at some point for all the bailouts and, and things that he's put in place. What changes to specific taxes do you foresee um, in the future? Um, that's a very good question. Um, and I guess my first point, just a general point, first of all, I mean, I think um, a, a big debate has been, and, and probably on the back of the Chancellor's comments, is when do you start repaying back what we're seeing at the moment? Because clearly, we look at the debt levels that, that UK government are, are, are at the moment. So I think debt's about over 100% of UK GDP. You think about if you make your mortgage and, and how much debt you first, you know, load of uh, land to value ratio, that sort of thing. So it's pretty clear, really high level historically. I think the point that we'd make is that um, what we've seen historically paying back these sort of huge debt levels is that what you need to first do is get a, an economy growing, first of all. Mm -hmm. um, that's going to be really key because what you want to do really is and try and make it, if you get the economy growing, then it makes it much more easier to generate the tax um, to pay back the deficit. Um, in contrast, if you cut too early, if you start um, raising taxes too early, start cutting spending too early, um, what you may do is actually be, in many ways, be self-defeating 
because yeah. you, you see a lot of businesses, you know, not, you may get higher unemployment, you may get more businesses failing. So the, the chance is to be really careful in terms of timing of this. Um, I mean, my view, our view would be that you need, at least need to leave, wait at least another couple of years before you even start thinking about sort of tight, tightening your belt. Because if you get an adaptation and the economy is actually growing quite a lot at a point, again, you may broaden the tax base and, and may do other things there. Um, in terms of what taxes, um, I think that's really challenging uh, at this age. I mean, uh, I think the question for the government is what is what is taxes they should cut to help, uh, uh, sorry, to, to raise to that make more sense from an economics point of view and what would they not touch from a political point of view that's going to be very important because there's a lot of taxes and you look at the conservatives manifesto that they've already promised that they won't cut yeah. there's very little room um in terms of tax they, they they're able to raise over that period and so, i mean our view in terms of business taxes they may look to uh, rebalance um some of the taxes that businesses pay so you know you look at some parts of the economy that are more likely tax than others um you know digital one example of that um, and there's obviously debate going on at the moment with the there's a business rates review going on at the moment and clearly there's a, a, there's a question between what business what people who have bricks and mortars pay versus those who have money online so that may be something they, they look at um they may look at sort of equalizing sort of you know corporation tax you know they've already said they're 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 postponing some of the sort of increase down seventy percent, so they may look to gain some ground there. But it's going to be really difficult. And, and you look at some of the personal taxation side, a lot of the stuff there they've already promised not to cut. Uh, so I think there's going to be real challenges in terms of what they they look to do. But again, I would reiterate the point: they need to wait until the economy is growing, because that, that automatically makes sure that I mean that the deficit is coming down at that point. Uh, and the last, just quickly on this last point, I will just make. Obviously, if you favour as deficit reduction, it's around sustainability and getting the debt back to a sustainable level is a much more practical way of doing it. Um, because, of course, you see other countries around the world in a similar position to ourselves. So, actually, at the moment, having high debt levels is not necessarily a problem. It may have been in previous years. Thank you very much. And I, I agree, increasing taxes does not necessarily increase the tax take. So, uh, I wouldn't want to be in his shoes, but it's careful consideration. Um, so, uh, moving on to a slightly more general question, what do you think the biggest threat to the UK economy is? Is it the pandemic or is it a no deal Brexit? That's a very, another very good question. I think people, I've ever heard it somewhere on Twitter, someone calling it Brovid, um, <laughs> a no deal uh, exit and, and, and the COVID. And I think what I would say is, is there are probably two different impacts in terms of the impact on the UK economy. So you've um, you've seen the sort of impact of the of COVID, which is very much a short, a temporary, sharp impact, where you saw obviously the UK economy potentially lo locking down overnight, um, and the impact on that may be relatively short. So you look at most uh, economists' view in most pessimistic will say that we're going to get back to pre-pandemic levels in a couple of years, um, but we still can get back at some point to those to those levels. Whereas, um, so it's essentially a temporary, a temporary, a temporary hit. Um, but what we what we see with, with the end of the transition period is that's going to be more permanent. So the impacts likely be felt over, over a longer period of time. Um, so, so you know, you, you talk about sort of decades, and you know, potentially in terms of again, that depends on what the impact is and what type of deal we get. So on Brexit specifically, I think it depends what where we get a deal or no deal. I think that would have, in terms of the short term impact, that would have, that would have a, a effect so if you get a nodal so the sort of the exit that could see huge rising costs for businesses huge disruption to supply chains which have been disrupted really by covid and that kind of an impact if we do get a deal there's still as you saw my from my side there's still a lot of questions that businesses need answering and in either scenario we won't get if you don't get answered to those questions you'll still you'll see hit to the wider economy from that um, now beyond that period we're going to 2021 and beyond um, i think it will depend on how how good the government are at replicating some of what we had the EU. So one example of that would be um, in trade deals. So we've seen governments sort of hard at work trying to replicate some of those continuity deals that we had with countries that we had as membership of the EU. Japan's prime example of that, which we've seen was signed uh, a couple of weeks ago. And now the government has sort of pledged around, I think they've said around, they're going to uh, sort of promise to sign around 80% of trade deals that we had previous um, to uh, uh, where we have as an EU member at the moment. Um, whether they meet that target is going to be probably going a long way to signing the impact of Brexit. 
Um, and also, you know, whether some of the other mitigations around that, you know, government policy say, offsets on the impact of, of, the, of Brexit. So at the moment, I would say overall, it's, it's, well, we're probably more certain about the impact of COVID than we are about the impact of Brexit, because again, it's, it's going to play out over a number of years. Thank you. I mean, one of the entrance polls we did asked about um, asked the attendees to um, say whether they believed we'd get a deal or not, which was pretty much evenly split between no, yes, and don't know. What's your personal opinion? Uh, I'll probably write with the poll. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's, I mean, I think we will get a deal. I get, but I guess the next question is how good a deal that's going to be. So I think you know, in probability, I think over fifty percent that we'll get a deal. But the question is, what type of deal you'll get? And our concern is that you're going to get a very thin deal, which means, I mean, even with a trade deal, even with the best possible trade deal, you still can get high cost of businesses trading. You know, it's still never going to be as good as a, you know, you know free access, access to the market. Um, and that's the reality for businesses that, that many businesses need to understand, really. And um, it's just how the, how good a deal that is. I, I mean, our view, again, is they may get a very thin deal, which tackles certain areas. I think we've seen some of that sort of leak previously so you know there may be hits to um to the car market to the financial services as well i think seeing some of that sort of leaked in the last couple of weeks um and what we may see over the next couple of years is that being built on um which is which is good once you get to the finals end date well the concern is that you are going to see consistent um transitional costs for businesses as they adjust to constant changes to trading arrangements which are going to have an impact on businesses yeah, thank you. So maybe moving on to some sort of more sector specific questions we've had. Now, you talked about retail and how that picked up quite quickly after the lockdown was eased, but that retail, sorry, online presence is obviously a massive help for that. One of the questions we've had posed is whether you foresee the um, complete closure of some retail shops in the near future, which has sort of been enhanced by the pandemic, but also the, the massive growth with online shopping. Yeah, I see one interesting trend of this pandemic is that it's probably accelerated a lot of trends that are already happening. And I think one of the ones you absolutely mentioned is the sort of different, is, is the sort of decline as well, sort of city centres, town centres, and move to on, online uh, shopping. It's certainly accelerated. I mean, you see people say, say three or four years, that's probably about right. Um, I, I think it has. I still think we are seeing some businesses, I think what we've seen, some, a lot of data, like footfall data for shops, and that did pick up in, in the period. But of course, what the issue with those sort of type of shops is that social distancing has a bigger impact. So you, so you may have see those big queues on some of those big queues outside shops, but actually the amount of actually sales going through and activity going through is actually much more limited uh, through that. So I guess it depends on how long those restrictions are still in place, because that's impacting in terms of retail sector, it's impacting those who have a retail, uh, a stronger, sort of stronger bricks and mortar presence those have a more, a more of an online presence. Um, so more probably we see that trend continuing. Um, and we're seeing that, you know, in the high streets across the board. It's, and I guess the challenge is for those types of businesses is how they can adapt their business. Do they go online overall or do they change the, the shopping experience? Um, and I think we may see some of that. And I think, I think we saw some of that before the pandemic hit. And we'll, we'll see more of that sort of going forward. It'd be quite interesting. Okay, perfect. Thank you very much. Um, and, and that's a sort of a specific question, but what do you think the impact of working on home will working from home will have on the commercial property sector? Um, I think in short, quite a big impact. Obviously, we can see that at the moment. Some of that's probably delayed by the people being in contracts. I know from my own place in, in the heart, in sort of this Joseph's Park, is that we're in a contract for three years. So while well, most, pretty much all of us are working at home, you know, we're, we're, we're still paying for, and you pay for that property. So I think there's delayed a little bit. But I think you, you are going to see that impact. I think you are seeing such an impact on those sort of shops that rely on people getting into commercial properties. So you're seeing sort of shower shop, et cetera, I think a big hit. Um, but I think you are seeing, um, I think you will see a lot more empty properties. Um, whether those properties can be repurposed into other types of outlets. Um, I would say that's, that's, that's a continuing trend. Again, what we've seen sort of pre COVID more sort of flexible working. I think more people are happy we see now we can do sort of events online and, and that sort of thing. I think that trend will continue. It's just whether certain sectors where the sort of issues around collaboration, collaboration can still be easily done over, like, over sort of Zoom, et cetera. So I think you still may see some hubs um, where you can uh, facilitate more greater collaboration. So you may see more businesses sharing premises, for example. Uh, but in terms of the mechanics, day-to-day -day activity, 
you can see we're seeing more and more of that being done online. Yeah, perfect. Thank you. So we just we just had a question posted. So I'm just going to read this one to you, which will probably be our last question actually to wrap up for half past. How much do you think the government schemes have helped consumer spending over the past couple of quarters? And do you see consumer spending improving or staying stable once the schemes are finished? Um, so I think they've been a big hit. So I think there's two factors that be driving increased consumer spending. First is the sort of the lockdown in, and, and unwinding the lockdown. So, so people couldn't simply spend their money during, during, that, during that period. You can go to restaurants, et cetera. And the very fact that you've opened the economy again, well, you'd actually get that sort of bounce back and pent up demand from that. But what's also helped with that is the is the VAT cuts for retail hospitality, which has been extended now to uh, through into next year, but also the Eat Out the Help Out scheme in August that had quite a big impact on 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 re on on, on um, restaurants in particular. And I think even some restaurants have extended that further privately, which shows you impact of that. So I think they've had a, quite a big boost. Um, and whether that's going to be sustained, I sceptical about that so i think a lot of what we're seeing at the moment is temporary in terms of the boosts and what we're going to see as we move particularly past the furthest game so into november i think we are going to see unemployment surge which is going to have an impact on wage growth but also on consumer confidence as well so i think that's going to have an impact as well so you may see that's sort a of wave in sort of q4 into q1 this year into next year sorry but it will be it will be interesting to see the stats when, when they come out. Um, thank you very much. I think we need to wrap up now because we're almost up to the hour. Um, I just want to let everybody know that we've got a couple more webinars that we're doing on the 13th and the 20th of October. Information is on our website um, and, and please do feel free to join. We'd very much like your attendance. Um, and thank you very much today for joining. Thank you again, Sue. Thank you.